Hey everyone, Matt Calderoni here, co-host of the Difference Maker Podcast. Really quick ask, we need your help. So here's the thing, we take the time each week to put these episodes together with the genuine intent to help people discover and reach their true potential, just like yourself, so you can get to that next level in life. All we're asking for is a quick subscription or you know, a like, a review, a comment, something that helps grow this channel and helps us boost that algorithm. We don't do any kind of paid advertising for this. We don't do any real marketing other than through our social media channels. We're genuinely here to help people and to help you. So if you can, leave us a quick rating, leave us a quick review, subscribe if you're tuning in on YouTube, and we'll see you in the episode. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Difference Maker Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Calderoni. We've also got Chris Calderoni here as well. What's going on, everybody? Glad to be back with this. We've taken a couple weeks to kind of just get some stuff done, um, some little changes we've been making around here, which has been great. So it's it's nice to get back into things. But let's start right into it and dive into it. This is something that's been coming up a lot, actually, over the last little bit. Again, uh, it's something we did a previous episode on, funny enough, but we figured why not kind of give the people what they want answer this question for them and go from there, but really helping you overcome the three or overcome the hurdle, sorry, and the three steps that we take to navigating mental challenges going through an injury. Because I feel like a lot of times there's so many different kinds of physical protocols in place to get back from a mental or sorry, to get back from an injury. But we want to dive in on the mental side because that's really where most athletes struggle during this time. Oh, it's so important. Like even with, um, actually I've had three or four major injuries that have happened. I think one one of your guys just went down a couple weeks ago too. Mm. Um, stuff that can happen, whether it be lingering from the season before or even just something that you pick up in season. Like, it sucks. It sucks. You can't control it. And I think that's the hardest thing for a lot of people is just the fact that you can't control when it happens. You just kind of have to... Got to go through it. Take it. Yeah. Like, and whether you're lucky where it's um, a rather fast recovery, or if you're unlucky where it's something like, you know, if you let it build and build and build, then it sticks with you for a bit. Like, injuries, man, they are, they suck. They're a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're, they're pain. So, having, having a way to just deal with it mentally and not only physically, but on the mental side too, like, even with all the physical stuff that you do, I've gone through injuries, you've gone through injuries. Um, some of the stories that I've heard with some of our athletes, like the mental struggle in the sense of when you're doing the physical work, because it's not your normal physical work, like yeah. it's slowed, it's controlled, it's, you can't go full intensity sometimes, all that stuff. Well, even it's on tough. the other side too, like there's a real loneliness and isolation that comes when you're playing on a team and you're injured. Right. Like, let's be real for a second. I think where before we get into the little story part of this, but where teams get this wrong is like how they handle injuries with players from a mental perspective. Like even looking at, OK, do they feel like they're a part of the team right now? Am I isolating them? Are we including them still? Are we finding ways for them to come in? And I get it. Look, I'm not naive to things to say, hey, I don't know what's going on here. But truth be told, there's a much better way, in my opinion, for teams to handle the recovery mentally of athletes when they're going through an injury and to make sure that they're feeling like a part of the team still. You know, a lot of these individuals, unfortunately, get left behind on the road trips or a lot of these, you know, youth athletes aren't allowed to practice with their teams until they get better. And they miss that camaraderie. They miss that team bondingness, that togetherness, that ability to kind of share with the team. And I think teams need to do a better job at this going forwards or they're going to have a much tougher time having their athletes return from injury the way that they need them to. Yeah, it's definitely a tough situation all around because, I mean, you feel for the individual, but it's kind of like, well, you got to go through it. Yeah, you have you know? to, can't be told. So anyways, to kick this off, we actually had an NFL client that is just finishing going through his injury recovery, and it's been a wild one. So poor guy got a stinger a couple, I would say what's a couple a months ago. Stingers when it's... Don't quote me on it because I don't know exactly. Or what's his definition? Yeah, the, 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 there's a big science term to it. But if you type in stinger, like football injury on Google, you'll be able to find it. It's something that often the big men get in performance, like your linemen. And what really happens is it's a neurological thing where you get hit. You kind of it's two forces meeting essentially like together, like boom, boom, like hand to hand. And when you get that, there's a there there's a nerve 
there's something to do with your nerve endings that get compressed during that time and you lose a bunch of strength. So even though you might be physically feeling okay, you aren't able to be as strong as you were before. Oh, so it's nerve damage. Because I had someone else, damage, he yeah. had, um, so instead of compression, it was stretched mm -hmm. in his shoulder. Yeah, that's where and, you got it, upper uh, body, shoulder. Yeah, and it was stretched. And how long it actually, for the nerve to, to yeah. heal, took like... Took a month uh, and a half? No, it took um, uh, a year. He just yeah. got back Nerves are bitch, man. Week. But he said, because, so all the testing that they did... Um, because that nerve was stretched and it was damaged, he wasn't, so the muscles weren't firing. That's exactly what this is. That's a stinger. Okay. That's but stinger. instead it's compression yeah. as opposed to stretch. That's a stinger. So okay. with him, what was crazy about this injury was they're like, hey, by the way, we're going to deactivate you on the roster. And we don't know if this recovery is going to take a week, a month, or six. Ne from what I understand. Nerves from, suck. From, yeah, that kid that went yeah. through it. So nerves are... There's not much you can do. It sucked. So it was tough for him because the biggest thing for him is that he had to go through, he did go through a bit of a grief cycle with his injury. Like when he first started this injury, there was a, a depressional period because he was just getting ready to ramp up and get his opportunity because he was a depth player and there were the right amount of injuries and conditions and he was ready to go and he was, he had a great preseason when he was coming in and now he's ready to take action and then all of a sudden he gets a stinger. So there was a bit of that grief that he he went through, which we'll talk about. And then his, the other thing that made this really tough is that his timelines kept getting pushed back. And this is something that a lot of athletes go through in the injury process that mentally thrashes them, if you will, because it's like, this is where they're getting ready to return. They're getting ready, getting ready, getting ready. They're right there, right there, right there. And then all of a sudden we need another two weeks and it's like, oh my God. And then you have to go through that entire process again. Right. And then the grief of just Getting told you have to go take another two weeks now, that even gets harder. Oh, it's almost like you get injured again. It's like you get injured again. Yeah. So he goes through that. But the big thing that helped him kind of get through this was when we pulled him out of that grief cycle in those dark days by changing his identity. And this is the key to anybody getting injured that we're going to discuss today because there are three steps, like it says, that we take. And that's when everything started to change. So he got a new vision for himself. He knew who he wanted to be coming back. He wanted to be better than he was before. He had new targets that he was setting. He was tracking his weekly progress. He built a certainty. And as a result of that, he is right there waiting for that return, but he's in a much better mental space than he was before. Mm. So the whole point to this and the reason that we're going in on it is because you need to have these three steps as well if you're an athlete. That way you can navigate the same way because if you don't, Truth be told, you run a fairly high risk, even if your injury is acute and there was a big thing coming up, meaning that it's a small injury, but let's say there was a major tournament coming up and you have to miss it now. We need to make sure you avoid that. So to dive right into it, we have to help you understand first the grief cycle, because this is where you'll really start to understand the psychological impact of injuries in sport. Right, so here's how this works, and the cycle actually aligns with the injury return cycle. So here's what usually happens when you get injured. First step is denial. And if you can picture this, it's like a big what? What is that? When it, the U? Is that what it is? An inverted U? No, it's a U. Mm -hmm. It's a U shape, right? So it's like a U shape if you can picture it, where. At the top of this U, the first initial thing, most athletes when they first get injured are in a, den a denial stage hmm. where it's like, this, there's no way this could happen to me or maybe they downplay the injury or it's not that bad or whatever. That's exactly what this NFL player was doing. I, I was going to say, I think the initial phase is, or I, I would say most common hmm. would be um, downplaying of the injury. For sure. I, like it's not that bad. I only have a week instead yeah. of three. Oh, it four. doesn't hurt that much. My con How many times have we heard? My concussion's not that bad. <laughs> right it's yeah. just a mild concussion it's like it's still a concussion dude so anyways so denial is the first step and this even happened too with one of our nba players that was going through it where it's like oh it's just it's just a tight hamstring turns out being a month recovery it's like that's not a tight hamstring dude or, that's a that's an injury or someone else who was hit in the back this season mm -hmm. thought oh you know my back is just spasming he ended up chipping a bone on his there you go on his back and so like, that, holy well and that's why it's like if you are an athlete going through it right now <laughs> and you're hearing us talk about this you need to get out of the denial stage mm -hmm. so that's the first step to the injury recovery the second step or i should say the injury grief cycle is anger so once you have that denial and you get through that and you're like okay i'm injured 
Oftentimes what ends up happening with the athlete is they get angry, pissed off, frustrated, annoyed, and usually they direct it at themselves, the circumstance of the injury, or somebody else, like a teammate, coach, whatever. Uh, oftentimes what we see with athletes going through this part of it is if only I trained harder and they beat themselves up and they call themselves stupid, which you should never do, or it's why would coach make my practice like that? Why would he throw or she throw so much intensity into it and aggression? I never would have got hurt. Or it's the stupid trainer on my team. They didn't know what they were doing. It's their fault. I had that. I'll never forget when I tore my glute. That was an awful injury that I had when I was a, a soccer player. I was coming back. I train. I, I'll never forget. We went on. My brother and I went on top of a, a training pitch, which was a hill, and we started hitting long balls to one another. I didn't do any warm up. It was March. I was supposed to be going to play in like two weeks, and I ended up tearing my glute 13 millimeters and my groin 12, and it was brutal. And it was like, oh my gosh. First, it was denial. It's not that bad. I don't know what it is. I just I feel a little bit of a pull. The next day, I couldn't get out of bed. And then we had my chiropractor at the time. She came over and tried to adjust me. And obviously, it didn't do anything because it was a muscle tear. It wasn't a back problem. And that's when I went into the anger stage of she made it worse when really she didn't. It was me it, kicking you, you during You just the didn't cold. know. Yeah. Right? It was me kicking during the cold. So, and this really, this anger really comes from, if you break it down, the athlete feeling out of control. Right? Because it's like, I can't do anything about it. I'm pissed off. I'm frustrated. I'm annoyed. That's the, that's the reality of this. So that goes down. And then once that goes down, finally, you get into the worst part, the lowest part of the injury process and the grief process. And that's the bargaining stage. And the bargaining stage can also be replaced with the word desperacy, where you start doing things that are out of character and you start bargaining with your character what you or with who you are, essentially. It's the lowest point where it's like one of those if only stages, right? Where it's like, you know... If I ever get through this again, I'll never, if I get through this, I'll never do this again. I'll train harder. I'll be better. But you essentially, this is the lowest point because you question who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. And that's what's hard. And in the traditional grief cycle, so think of it. Let's pretend you lose a loved one to a horrific accident. There's the original denial. Then there's anger. And then the lowest part is how could this have happened? And it's that questioning of how could this have gone down? How could... That's the thing that gets people most. Interesting. They sit in their grief, right? They sit in the past. <clears throat> so I'm just curious about that because the can, so what was that fourth one? The I'll never be there. I'll never do this again. I'll train harder. Which was, was that one? Which stage was that? Oh, that's the bargaining stage. The bargaining stage. This one. So yeah. I'm just curious about that because can that help someone on their not speeding up their recovery? Like that can hinder. Can it hinder? That hinders. Because I'm when just someone, curious, because maybe I'm thinking about it different. Because when someone's bargaining, they're living so far in the past that they can't take steps forward. Okay. So I'm thinking I'm thinking about it differently. Like yes. not rushing back to come back and then um, So you know what this is? Bargain here's the best way to explain it. Bargaining is when you get an injury. Yeah. You go through the denial of it, you get angry, and then once you're done with the denial and the anger, it's a poor like why me? Okay, That's I, I was that thinking. Is. Okay, I people, was thinking about it different. Well, what actually gets people stuck in this process is is the why me, where they're always going through with, I can't believe it. Ha they're dwelling, yeah, and because yeah. they're dwelling so hard and so much, they don't move forwards at all. So this is like this was a great example. There was a, a lady who came to us talking about her injury, saying, I just can't get over this knee injury. I don't know how this could have happened. So when she came on the call in the consultation call that we had. Everything she was saying was about, I can't believe this happened to me. I can't believe that this was me. I can't, if, if I come back, this will never happen. But she was living so far in the past. She didn't look whether or not she knew it. She was self-sabotaging her ability to move forward. Right? Because it's like, oh my God, how could this happen? It's like, that's great. You're focused on the problem, not the solution. Well, hey, that was literally me this summer. Yeah, I, I did that with uh, for any <laughs> for any older athletes listening, <laughs> um, not ramping up training before going into a season. My Achilles was not that it you know split or anything, but just constantly sore. Yeah, and what's that from? That's from instant overuse instead of building it up, right? It's and instant then you, overuse. And then I go, th I went through it. I, like it was that thought of oh, man, I'm 31. How am I doing? Like, how is this happening to me? I, I work out, I'm athletic, I do this, but I wasn't taking the right protocols the to, steps to go to 
prepare myself, right? Yep. So then, and that's, so you get it now, the bargaining stage. And then once you're done bargaining, you get into, in my opinion, one of the worst, which is the depression stage. And the depression stage is where you're sad or down because of the impact that your injury has on who you are and what you're able to accomplish. So this can really be part, this can really be intense, sorry, for athletes who have an injury that's really going to impact the future of their ability to perform. The depression side is very high. This is very, very tough for athletes who are going through this part of the process where it's, okay, you know, I just got injured and I'm going to be missing a major tournament. This is tough for any athlete in general, but more amplified, we'll say, when they're about to have a major milestone that was supposed to happen in front of them and they can't accomplish it because of this injury. And now it's shut. For example, Kevin De Bruyne, um, Champions League. Champions League. League. Back-to-back yeah. years. Mm-hmm. Was this his ankle or something? something? Back-to-back years gets injured in the Champions League final. Year and, before they lose, year after they win. And then that went into the Euro, I think. Yeah. In 2022? Yep. I think so. It's hard, right? And then the last part of the traditional stage is once you finish your depression, you get to a stage of acceptance. And acceptance is when you accept the injury that's happened. It's the end stage. And this is where you're like, okay, whatever I got to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to move on. I have a problem with that, though. Because that means that all that stuff that's been going on leading up to it hasn't really been resolved to the best of its ability. So what we follow at Molotinum here, we actually add a sixth and final stage onto this, and we call it reinvention. And this is the kickoff to everything you need to do if you've been injured as an athlete to start getting to the next level now and getting back as quick as you can. The moment you get injured, it should be okay. You go through this process as quick as you can. You accept it. I got hurt. I tore my ACL. I pulled my back. I have a disc issue, whatever. Accept it. The thing you need to do right away after that And we're going to talk about it today, but you need to align your process immediately and ask yourself, who am I going to be when this process is done? Mm -hmm. That's That's the quickest way to get out of this. It's reinvention. It's what we label here at Molotium. Yeah. Uh, No, I was going to say like with those lengthy injuries, right? I always hear a lot of players or a lot of players that, um, yeah, I talk to when they get this injury is I want to come back the same player that I was bullshit and i for me anyways like in a lengthy injury whether you're you know healthy or going through the injury in a year's time you're not going to be the same player that you were well it's funny that sets up really terrible expectations for the player because then once you come back and without resolving all that stuff before like you said like the reinvention process and working towards something like it's the same you're working towards something it's just a different um it's a different trajectory that you are currently on yeah that so for me like that sets up just really kind of harsh expectations for the person because they want to come back immediately where they left off and that's not going to be the case like even if you were healthy that's not going to be the case you're not going to be the same player that you were a year ago well i was even talking to an athlete the other day i was like one that actually just got injured and it's like how many times at the pro level at least do, does a team give you the opportunity with pay to sit out, better yourself, and come back better than you were before? Now, that's only if you have the mindset to do it. Who was it? Nelson Mandela that said, that I don't lose, I either win or I learn. Right? Well, what if we shift that mindset to, I don't get hurt, I only, you know, progress or find a way to get better? Like, injuries have, injuries will always take on, this is a very key insight, Injuries will always take on the meaning that you give it. Yeah. Oh, if it's 100%. catastrophic, it will friggin' eat you alive, man, catastrophically. If you give it the meaning of this is a time to sit back and reinvent who I am, it will definitely take that meaning on. I watch it with DJ Reed. DJ Reed, our, our client now for a while, great friend too. It's like, I'll never forget when he tore his pack a couple weeks before going into camp in a year that he needed to have a year for his contract and and ball out and do his thing. And a year where he needed to really pull through, a year that he was almost on his last opportunity to prove himself, and he tears his pec two weeks before, literally a week after we started our program for the first time ever. DJ 
has had one of the best minds I've ever seen towards an injury. Because he goes, I don't give a shit what's going on. Mm. I'm going to come back and I'm going to fucking dominate. It's like, let's do it. And that's when he came back. He comes back week six in the season. He gets dropped by the 49ers. He gets signed by the Seahawks. He gets told by his coach, I think he can ball, but you're third on our depth chart and you're starting as a, as a nickelback and then you'll come in his corner rotating. He rotated game by game for the entire rest of the season. But here's the funny part. The game DJ came back, he gets an interception and his aunt dies the day before. Coming back from the most catastrophic pec injury going forward. And I, when we talked about it before the game, talking about his aunt, he goes, hey, man, you know, we went through everything, his alter ego and all that stuff that we built with him. He goes, I'm going to ball out today. I said, yeah, you are. So when I spoke to him after the game, I said, how'd you feel? He goes, dude, he goes, as tough as that was, I was mentally and emotionally prepared. And I knew the new DJ I wanted to show to the world. That was the mentality of what DJ Reed went through when he tore his pec two weeks before starting a season where literally the rest of his career depended on it well, at a very young age. I was going to say at a junior level, at a junior level last year in hockey, I was working with a player who um, maybe a month into the season, it was, uh, he was having a practice, went into the end boards and broke his femur. Pooh. And, um, it was like, oh yeah, I remember this. It was, it was insane. It was as soon as the season started, broken femur, and it's like, holy man. So, X-rays come back and everything. He actually broke it clean. Hmm. And normally, if so, when you break your femur, if it if it splinters or if it's not, it, like I saw the X-ray, it was legitimately Cut just off, yeah. clean. And. Um, he was lucky. The doctor said with the right things and the right everything, like rehab, all this stuff, you are lucky that you could do this in three months instead of six months. Yeah, because usually when you break your femur, you have to have a, a metal rod put in. Broke it so clean. The next day, he was walking up and down stairs, number one. Number two, he had the very straightforward mentality of, I'm going to reinvent myself coming. I, if I can, I'm coming back into the season. He gets to play. So he gets cleared, gets to play last game of the season before they hit playoffs and scores a goal there you go. in the last game. And it's like, if that wasn't shifted in a way where it's like you broke your femur, this was, his, I think, one of his last couple chances to get looked at by schools and stuff like that. And he does it. And I mean, came back and did his thing. Yeah, you know, well, th and this is this is why, like, I feel like people think that this is an anomaly type of thing. Like DJ was an anomaly. This kid was an anomaly. They weren't men. They had a straight, like you said, a straightforward focus on who they wanted to be when they came back. They said, regardless of all the shit going on around me, here's who I want to be. I'm going to listen to this person, going to listen right. to this person, going to listen to this. I'm person. just going to do my thing and yeah. I'm not going to care about what's going on. I'm head down, headstrong gun pointed to me and I'm going. Yeah, I know the problem. Here's my solution. Yep. And that's that's where I wish a lot more athletes had this mentality towards anything they accomplished in their sport, where it's like, I don't care what you're going to say. I was just talking, funny enough, to, to an NHL player of ours who's just starting to make now into the NHL. He was AHL last year and made the jump. Before this podcast, he called. He is currently on the bottom level right now of playing on an, on an NHL team, which is that he needs to prove his worth, go through it, and basically he's going to be the guy who's taken out every couple games. He's going to have an inconsistent role, and he's going to be the guy who, if he makes a mistake, he will be the whipping boy. He will be the public teaching. He will be the individual that you know, will be shown what not to do and told up more times than not, this is what you're doing wrong. But his mentality is so headstrong towards what he wants that he's going and he's doing it. Mm -hmm. And he's the only player who made it this year from camp and stuck from the AHL as a younger player and was able to make that roster. That's a reality. I wish more athletes had this mentality, though, of I don't give a shit what people say. Because here's the truth to everybody tuning in. Everyone's going to talk everyone's going to say shit. Everybody's going to talk shit to you. 
That's just how this goes. There, look, life is 80-20, right? 80% of the time things will, you know, go your way. 20% of the time they won't. You can also flip that. 20% of the time, you know, is when things will go my way. 80% of the time they won't. Regardless, it's the Pareto principle. But point being, 80% of the time, this is what I'm learning about. This is what I'm learning about athletes who have the ambition to try and make it professional. You know, sorry, just before you go forward, I think it, so 80, it's 80-20 of things will go your way, 20 won't, but it feels like 20% of the things yes. go your way. And, and, the, and the little things this, feel a lot Well, bigger, this is what I was right? going to say with, with people who think you can make it as an athlete, because I went through it. I will say 80% of the people told me it was going to be very hard. 20% of the people said I can do it. Mm-hmm. That's what I will say, and I've noticed when it comes to athletes trying to make it to the next level. Everybody loves to tell you how hard it's going to be. Everybody loves to tell you because misery loves company. And this is what we're talking about in the in the injury process. You need to rip yourself out of to make sure you avoid. So there are three things that we follow whenever it comes to the injury process with an athlete. Take notes, write these down that you need to follow if you're going through it. Number one, the Difference Maker podcast is something that Chris and I put a lot of work into and it's something we love to do for you. So all we're asking in return, please, if you can, leave a review leave a rating, leave a comment on our podcast. It helps us get ranked higher and it helps us continue to bring you free content. We're not asking for anything else. We don't do any kind of paid promotion for this. We don't do anything you know, surrounding it. We're literally bringing you the top free pieces of content that we use with our best athletes to make sure that we can get you the resilient skills they have. So please, if you can, leave a review leave a rating, make sure to subscribe to us, click the notification bell if you're tuning in on YouTube, leave a comment down below, just help us grow this channel so we can help bring you or keep bringing you free content. Number one, you need to first envision your future. We're gonna break that down in a sec and teach you how to do that. This is all about changing who you are and your in your ideology and you know your identity, who you want to become at the end of this process, who you want, you want to reinvent yourself into. And a, it's all about changing your state immediately. Okay. It's about getting to this point of I'm injured as quick as you possibly can when you're injured. Stop denying it, own it, move forwards. Okay. Step number two, you need to make sure you resolve the past. This is all about removing limiting beliefs and getting to the end of the grief cycle as quick as you possibly can. Depression is what lives in the past and in stagnant periods of your life. That's the truth. So when you're not doing anything to move forwards and you're stuck in the past and you haven't resolved it, you are going to have a very tough time reinventing yourself. And then once you envision the future and resolve your past, you can now take action and create in the present. And that's all about taking action on the person you want to be and doing your rehab. So there's two steps before you actually get into your rehab that we're going to cover here that you need to do. And then once you get through these two steps and you answer these questions we're about to give you, you will be fine. Okay, so let's dive in. Step number one, envisioning the future. There's three things you need to do during this time. Number one, for Lord's sake, get a real diagnosis. Mm. I know this sounds basic, but the one thing I've noticed that holds most athletes back from going forwards is a real diagnosis. I, I was just texting with one of our NCAA players. This guy's been getting epidurals in his back, which is a wild, wild shot to receive because he's had disc injuries. He's gotten three in a time period that I will not disclose, but I will say it shouldn't have been. He has now come back to Canada and he is having to go see Canadian doctors now, which he went and did this morning. He texted me this morning and he goes, man, um, we know what the problem is now. So what was it? He goes, they were right about the epidural and me needing it. They were right about the type of injury I had. They were wrong about which vertebrae and disc It was happening at. Holy shit. So this kid was getting epidurals in the wrong discs into the wrong areas. For two months, this kid's been going through it now, a month and a half. And now he goes, now that I'm back in Canada, they actually need to wait now to give me the right epidurals in the right areas because I've gotten so many in this time period. Is that a common error? Beats me. With that? Beats me. But point being, get a real freaking diagnosis. Do not stop at one. Get a second opinion. 
And if the second opinion disagrees with your first opinion, go get a third opinion to see which one they agree with. Do not leave this to chance. That's what I was going to ask. With So will that help with... Because one of the questions that I had, how would you get out of the denial phase a little bit faster? Would that be it? Like having the knowledge Get a real of, diagnosis. Yeah. And, and would that take you through steps, like through the grief cycle, through steps one yeah. to four? When you and have doctors. Yeah, because you know how many doctors I've seen, and this isn't a shot, but it's just true. You know how many pro athletes we have who are supposed to be getting the best of the best that go to one doctor, get told one thing, then go to another and get told another, then go to another and get told another? With one being you need recovery, the other being you need rehab, and the other being you need surgery. It's fucking ludicrous, to be honest with you. But my point is, yes, to your to your point there, actually, this will help with the denial phase. But do not stop. This is where a lot of athletes make the mistake, and it's not your fault. Because you've been taught to just go to the doctor and accept what's being told. Get a second opinion if you're an athlete. Make sure that the second opinion aligns with the first. If it doesn't, you need to go for another opinion and see which one it aligns with. Because usually that third opinion will agree with the first or the second. Their second opinion, though, from a doctor is to just make sure that that initial first diagnosis is accurate. Then go get a second to make sure like it is. And then go get a, if, if there's a discrepancy, get a third. And if there's a discrepancy there, go to a fourth. And keep freaking going until you have two diagnoses that align. Oftentimes, though, you won't get past three. Now, I've seen horror horror cases where this one kid last year came to us. Father was a little bit out there, to be honest, like crazy, crazy athlete, sport dad type of thing. This guy had like, like six specialists working on him. Apparently he had a hip issue and then he had a disc issue, but it was a sacral issue, but it was a this issue and it was a groin. It was that. And it's like, that's when there's too many cooks in the kitchen where everybody wants to have their own opinion. Mm -hmm. You should have the first opinion, get a second. If the, if the second and first don't align, then get a third. Usually the third aligns. But the first thing is get a real diagnosis. Stop beating around the bush. Second thing, once you get a real diagnosis, understand the actual timeline. So, The hardest thing about the NFL player that we went through was, or what he went through was, okay, it's going to take a week. And then they said, well, this can actually take a month. And now it's week by week, day by day. That's hard. What I will say though, once you get your diagnosis, get a real timeline from people. Don't just, hey, this doctor said three weeks. This guy said six months. This guy said nine months. No, go get a real timeline from somebody. And this is where you can also include, once you get the diagnosis, bring it to a rehab specialist. Don't let a doctor who's a general practitioner, probably for most athletes, what they go to, or, you know, a sports doctor, like you need then to work in the rehab specialist to understand your timeline. Yeah. I I was going to say what's important about the timeline is not only for, for your own sake, but like understanding what, and depending on the injury, obviously, like, can I come back a little bit early or do I have, do I need to make sure so that I don't go through this again? Do I need to make sure that it is a strict deadline? Even if coaches are putting pressure on me to come back, even if this is putting pressure on me to come back, like one individual that I'm working with now, he's facing that where it's now you're cleared to go back on the ice for a second. Can you get back in in 10 days which like, by the way that's to tough, any man. to any athlete like if you're playing at an elite level even if it's just elite youth levels you are going to get pressured by your coach to come back mm-hmm. expect that that's not a bad thing no you just have to be strong enough to say no and that's why you need to understand your timeline because your coach let me tell you this love your coaches to death your coach will have no idea your coach will play it by the are you feeling good status the are you feeling good status is rarely ever right. Mm-hmm. Go by the timeline. I there's an a uh, an individual we're working with. He's an an official in a professional sports league. Had a back surgery. Goes, man, I feel good four weeks before my recovery. But you know what my my rehab specialist said? Don't you dare cheat it. Yeah. 
four weeks before, don't you dare. He goes, man, I feel like I can lift. He goes, I know I can lift. The rehab specialist said, in fact, you can probably go lift weights and so on, but don't cheat it. You have to do it fully. Knowing the timeline is what gives you the psychological sanity to say no to people when they try to push you. Because mm -hmm. coaches will push you. Your teams will push you. Your teammates will push you. Everybody will push you as far as they possibly think they can because you're probably a positive well, player. You'll push yourself. Like yeah. coming back, I feel like I can lift. I feel like I can skate. I can do, I can run. I can do everything. Yeah. It's like, man, you That's either hard. deal with this up front or don't come back to the sport. It's, it's like one of the two. That's why, right? So it's like, okay, so once you're understanding your timeline, just make sure now you understand how much time you have to work on yourself. If it's a month, you have a month. If it's a week, you only have a week. It doesn't matter how small or how big. You have time to work on yourself. And then the last part is if you're going to envision this future, this is where you need to shift your identity and get clear on who you want to become. So the only question you need to ask yourself is, by the end of this injury, who do I want to reinvent myself into? And that's how it goes. That's how it goes. And that's the one thing. And you describe that person in depth. I want to come back. I want to be a top goal scorer. I want to be somebody who breaks records. I want to be a leader. I want to be more emotionally, you know, in control. Describe the person top to bottom. Spend five minutes. Just close your eyes. Think about the person you want to be and write it all down after. That's the best way to do this. When we have a player who gets injured, the first thing we do with them, it's a session on their new identity. That's it. But once you have these three in place, you've now envisioned the future. Get a real diagnosis. It allows you to it allows you to mentally go through it better. Secondly, understand the timeline to your injury so you can start saying no to the jerks who are going to try to push you to come back early. And thirdly, now you need to shift your identity and get very clear on the person you want to become by the end of it. Okay. Now the next part of the framework or the step here, step number two, which is resolving your past. So again, this is all about your belief systems. Okay, so there's three major things that you need to do when you're resolving your past. First things first, get rid of the bullshit beliefs you have or what we call limiting beliefs. I like to call them bullshit beliefs, BS beliefs, right? BSBs. Why do we call it this? When you're injured, there will often be a belief that creeps into your head of, will I be able to come back as good as it was before? Mm -hmm. is, is all my progress lost? Is it over? Am I screwed? You're fine. You're in control. Yes, you might have to sit out for three months and it's a pain in your ass. Who gives a shit? You're in control of who you want to be when you come back. No, you're not going to be as better as you were before. You shouldn't be. You should be better than you were before. Or sorry, you, you, weren't, you might not be as good as you were before. You should be better than you were before, right? So this whole belief that creeps in of, will I be as good as I was before? Don't let that freaking run you. Call it out right away. So the easiest way to do this, there's three things we do. Get clear on the belief that keeps coming up or the voice in your head, right? Number two, come up with reasons as to why it's not true. And then number three, create an opposite belief. So I know this was a big one when it came to one of our NBA players. It was, I don't know if my leg will be able to hold up after this injury, which we then shifted to, well, that's not true because you've injured your leg multiple times, especially your hamstring. And then we changed it to, because I've injured my hamstring, I know how to get through this quicker than most players and what I need to do to come back stronger. And lo and behold, he did. He came back and he popped off with about 25 points that night. Point being, change your limiting beliefs. So many times athletes go through this process with a limiting belief in mind. And here's what happens. They actually do all these steps, but they're constantly being held by, oh my, or held back by, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can. And am I saying it's going to be perfect? No, it's not. You're going to question yourself sometimes, but at least when you become aware, that's the first step in removing something. Mm -hmm. Completely. Right. And you know what, for anyone that is going through an injury right now, and you just so happen to stumble on our, on our, uh, podcast, um, even if, well, even if you're not hurt, like injuries are part of part of what you signed up it's for. It's kind of, it's the business that you chose. Yeah. And if you haven't had one up to this point, like, Knock on freaking wood. Well done. Yeah. But they're going to happen whether they're injuries, like people getting hurt, hurt, or like little things that are going to be week to week. You Can know? I just say, though, this is exactly why in our programs, whenever we're working with an athlete, youth or professional, we understand who the person is around them that's in their ear the most. Sometimes it's a spouse. Sometimes it's a parent. Sometimes it's a sibling. Sometimes it's a teammate, a friend. And it's important for us to also coach them 
because the, your, your environment will often dictate your mental state more than anything else. Mm-hmm. So when you're around somebody who's like, I've seen this all, all the time. How could my poor baby get hurt? All the freaking time. It's like, dude, you signed the waiver. We all signed the same waiver. Like you with your Achilles. Is it a risk? Yes. Look at me. Hey, I am one of the people who flaked out of playing adult sports. <laughs> I had once winter I played, I took a step on a turf field because I thought I was a god on the soccer field still from before. I felt my Achilles pull in my left leg. And that day I said, I'm out. Was I hurt? Nope. Was it bad? No. I had a little bit of pain walking the next day. I didn't pull, like I didn't tear my Achilles, but that risk factor myself, I said, no, 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 I'm not signing up for this again. I did it for X amount of years playing professional soccer to play a little bit and playing, you know, competitive and collegiate and so on. I'm not doing this as an adult. Now, for the crazies, like my brother here, they decide to go through that on a Monday morning after playing a Sunday afternoon game and feel like shit the next day. And then it's hard to make, get up and move and wake up and you're tired and you didn't even know that you had some muscles that will get hurt. My point is, though, he willingly knows, God bless him, that he is going to go through it the next day. So do I. This is an example of two people who you see one decided to commit to the reality of the process and the other said, I'm out. Call me what you will. I will take that to my grave every day. I'm soft. I'm weak. Whatever you want to say. I do not want to wake up with hurting groins, a hurting ass, a hurting neck, a hurting shoulder, slipping the night before on the stupid turf because there were no rubber pellets put. I do not want to sign up for that. But if you are an athlete who's going through the competitive process right now, injuries are part of what you signed up for. Just like anything, less playing time. I think you have to be willing to well, one of the big things, the the biggest theme about this podcast is going through adversity. Yep. It, uh, athletics is such like an up and down roller coaster. And even, even if you're not playing professionally or at a high level, you know that even in, in games where they mean nothing and you're playing 6v6 at you're like a hard. pickup, you're going to go hard. But then even afterwards, you're going to think about it. It's like, damn, I should have done this and that and yeah. everything else. Like this is just part of the human side, I guess, of, of sports. You Absolutely. Know? Right? It's like, like, so I'm an avid runner now, right? I run miles, kilometers, wherever you're tuning in from per week. I love to. I even bought the Garmin watch, everything. I got right into it. The Nike shoes, the streetwear, all of that. If you saw me running, you would think I've, <laughs> I've ran a marathon before when I've never come close. I just do it to stay in shape and it's nice. Point is though, do I get sore from running? No. So I signed up for that process. Right. Does it push me, though? And I can clear my mind and think, yeah, so I like it for that. My point is, though, and coming back to the belief side, you have to understand when you're going through the injuries or the injury process, you need to resolve those beliefs that hold you back. Sometimes it's the belief of others. I've heard multiple times with our pro athletes and even our youth athletes. Oh, my poor baby won't come back the way they were before. Oh, how could this happen? Like I was saying before, how could this happen? It's going to happen. Part of what you did, even if you're playing one of the, even kickers in football get hurt, Mm -hmm. right? One of the most least contact sports ever. Golfers get hurt. Least contact. Point is though, resolve the limiting, the limiting belief. The second thing you need to do to resolve your past, you need to create a new conviction. A conviction is a belief that's going to get you through it. So think of Mr. DJ Reed. I'm going to come back and show the world what I'm capable of. Mm -hmm. That's a freaking conviction, man. That will make me even want to run through a wall, (laughs) right? Point is though, you need to come up with a conviction that you can stick to that motivates you. So DJs, he automatically had something he wanted to prove and he went and did it. Easy. So going through it, you need to create a conviction and you need to write it down. The last thing is to resolve your past, make a do not do list, please. A do not do list includes behaviors, beliefs, and people around you that you probably shouldn't be doing while you are going through your injury. So one of the things that most athletes screw up on when they're going through an injury, they throw away their schedule. Right. And because they throw away their schedule, they're staying up to all odd hours. They're not sleeping well. They're waking up at weird times, whatever. They're not getting through the rehab process well. That's the first thing. But secondly, oftentimes this is when we see athletes who slip into depressions and such. 
because now there's no purpose in their day. Now they're all over the place. And purpose is what leads to a fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. So when you feel like you have no purpose and you're sleeping at all odd hours and you're waking up at all odd hours and you don't feel like you're doing anything and you're not around the team because that's what happens when you get injured. Yeah, you're, you're, you're literally creating the perfect conditions to fall into a depression. Yeah. Right? So you need to create a do not do list. This can include things like food to eat. I, <laughs> there's so many athletes that we have where it's like, I can't eat that right now when I'm injured. Mm -hmm. That's a real thing. Don't throw out your diet. Don't throw out what you're doing. Get into that. Right? Now, once you do this, there's the last part that comes into this and you, you must create in the present. And there's two steps to this. Number one, you need to set only 30-day targets. Not 90 not 60, not 120. I don't care how long your injury is, 30. Here's why. When you are injured, take things in 30-day segments. It'll help you recover quicker. It'll help you rehab quicker. It'll help you stay on your process better. It will do all the right things. When I see athletes who are beyond focused on the 90-day steps and da-da-da, things change very quick when you're injured. You yeah. might only, even only have a process where you need to spend two weeks. I know a kid that we, we've we got, he had double shoulder surgery. Week to week, things were changing, mm -hmm. right? Week to week, progress, all that stuff. So 30 day targets is the best thing to do. Now, if you know on your timeline that your injury is going to take, you know, let's say three months. Minimum, well, like minimum, a minimum. Yeah, if they're like, hey, you tore your, you know, let's say your uh, meniscus or your ACL or something, it's going to take, you know, nine or six months, sorry, to recover. Or you tore your Achilles, whatever. That's a different, this is when you're going to follow on this. So when you're three plus months out, you only need to spend 30% of your time focused on your sport. Mm -hmm. That means you get up, you go to your rehab, you get it done and you get out. The 70% of the time, you need to actually shift your focus to being on life. Here's why. Oftentimes, athletes spend way too much time focusing just on their sport. When the sport's taken away from them, they lose who they are. You need to take the time during this time to realize your sport is only requiring for you to give it 30% of your focus per day. And 70% of the time, you need to do something else. Work on your intellect is the best way we can say it. So that means study something, learn something, build a skill during this time, read some books. Maybe you've always had a... a an interest to getting into sports management. Start doing that right now. Point is though, when you're injured, 70% of your time has to be spent on your personal life. Yeah. And relationships. Yep. Yeah. That's what's going to keep you going. That is. Now, when you're two months out, that's when you shift your focus to being 70% of your time now back on your sport, 30% of your time on your personal life. And that's when two months out is when you start visualizing, you start focusing on the skills again, because you're close to return. Mm -hmm. right you're close to return and if your injury falls within that timeline as well and you're like matt i only have a weak injury 70 percent on your sport 30 percent on your personal simple okay now the last thing is for this part when you're creating you need to get clear on your morning and nighttime routines have to we call it your morning power system and nighttime reload system when you are creating in the present do not miss the times you wake up and go to bed at it's that simple we say this all the time. It's something we see so many athletes make the mistake of, but they then mess up their entire rhythm. They lack the purpose. They lack the drive. They lack the motivation. And that's what kills them ultimately. So with that being said, you now have the three steps that we take with our athletes to get them out of injuries and out of that depressional period. And the one thing I'll say during this time, surround yourself with positive people. Mm -hmm. Get away from the naysayers. Get away from the pessimists. Get away from those people that are, you know, challenging you. Oh my God, I don't know if we can do this. Focus on the people that are around. So that's why even when we do work with athletes going through this and we do have them in our programs, one of the things we do is we vet their social social circles going through their injury. Yeah. Because at the same time, you don't need to be with the person who's drinking every Saturday night and doing whatever and then it derails you from your process. Mm -hmm. It's a very easy time to build bad habits, but it's also a very easy time to build great habits. So with that being said, down below, there are links if you would like to work with us in a one-on-one -on -one setting. You can apply to work with us in our one-on-one -on -one coaching program. We do only take on two athletes per week, and it is on a first-come, first-served basis on an application-only basis. That's the first thing. Second thing, if you want to work through this on your own, there's also a link down below. 
There's the Molotium Pocket Coach. It gives you 52 weeks worth of just resilience training that you do on your own with daily laid out habits, videos, and everything. It's fantastic. Our pros love it. Check it out. It's down there too. And if you want to just make sure to kind of keep up with us and see what's going on, we actually have a weekly newsletter that comes out with different tips than just our podcast, and it's great. Um, Sign up for that down below as well if you would like. It's all there. Now, With that being said, we barely do any kind of, you know, paid promotional stuff for this podcast. Please, if you can, leave a review, leave a rating, leave a comment. It helps us grow. Subscribe if you're tuning in from, you know, YouTube. Click the notification bell, please. I think, what'd you say? 70 or 60% of people, 70% of people that pass through aren't subscribed to our channel. Yeah. They like our stuff. If you guys like our stuff and and you're watching, um, I mean, we have different stuff that comes out on our YouTube channel too. It's a bunch of obviously short form video, like training training and and everything. So if you have questions, we're going to be coming out with more of those uh, within, in the next year. Not so yeah, I mean, next, hey, mu- we're we so we're at a cadence right now that we're going once a week, aiming to, yeah, right. So there's going to be a lot of stuff there for athletes that are or specific to soccer, hockey, like a bunch of different sports. So. And like you can see here too, though we're giving we're giving away the real stuff for free mm-hmm. because our belief is if you like what we're doing and we can change as many people as we possibly can with this, great. And it'll probably also help you understand that we can really help you if you were to come work with us. So either way, you're winning, we're winning, we're helping people, you're getting better. That's all that matters. We'll see you all in the next one. Take care.